Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about the binomial theorem. Long ago, when we studied polynomials, we learned that a binomial is an expression that has two terms. For example, each of the below is a binomial because it has two separate terms. x plus 7, 2l cubed minus 5, 3y squared plus root 2z. A binomial is anything we can put in the form a plus b. So some a and some b, all we're looking for to be a binomial is just having two terms. What if we wanted to see what happens if we raise a binomial to some power? If it was small, like a plus b squared, we could foil it, right? We could put one factor next to another factor, and then we just multiply them out by distribution and just work it out. We're used to doing that. We've been doing that for years. Wouldn't be that difficult. But what if it was really large, right? Like a plus b to the seventh, or even larger, right? We could do it by just putting all the factors out, but it's going to get really big, really messy, really fast. It's not going to be easy for us to multiply out a plus b to the seventh, and be even worse if it was a larger value than 7. So in this lesson, we're going to learn how to expand a binomial for any arbitrary power n. So if we have any integer n, we'll be able to use this to figure out how to expand a plus b raised to the n. To help us understand what we're working with, let's look at a plus b to the n expanded for various values of n. So a plus b to the 0 would just come out to be 1 because you raise anything to the 0 and you get 1. a plus b to the 1 comes out to be a plus b. a plus b squared would come out as a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. a plus b cubed would be a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. a plus b to the 4th equals a to the 4th plus 4a cubed b plus 6a squared b squared plus 4ab cubed plus b to the 4th. And and a plus b to the fifth would equal a to the fifth plus 5a to the fourth b plus 10a cubed b squared plus 10a squared b cubed plus 5ab to the fourth plus b to the fifth, right? So we can keep going in this way, but we're starting to see a pattern at this point, right? So we can realize that there's a pattern going on, and we can use this pattern to let us figure out general things about a plus b to just any n whatsoever. Let's look specifically at a plus b to the fourth and a plus b to the fifth above to help us see some properties about how binomials work. We'll be able to talk about a plus b to the n, the general expansion of a binomial, by looking at these guys in specific. So looking at these two as stand-ins for the general way that a plus b raised to the n expands, we notice various things. The first thing is that the expansion of a plus b to the n has n plus 1 terms. What I mean here is a plus b to the fourth, well, that would be at n equals 4. We count how many terms come out in the expansion. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's 5 terms total. We started with n equals 4. 4 plus 1, right, n plus 1. 4 plus 1 gets us 5, so we have 5 terms coming out of it. Same thing with a plus b to the fifth. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms total. 5 plus 1, 6 terms. So we wind up getting n plus 1 is the number of terms that come out. The expression also has symmetry. Powers of a decrease by 1 each step every time we move forward a term, while powers of b will increase by 1. See, we start off, if we have a plus b to the fourth, for example, we start off at a to the fourth, because a plus b to the fourth, the largest kind of a it will be able to produce, largest in the sense that it will have the largest exponent, will be a to the fourth, right? We managed to get a to the fourth out of it. And then the next one, we will wind up having a cubed, right? It's just step down 1. And the next term will be a squared, step down again a, step down again, and finally it turns blank, and a blank is another way of saying a to the 0, because a to the 0 is just 1, right? So it disappears. Same thing with the b's, except it does the reverse process. It increases. Since it's blank, it doesn't appear here. That's b to the 0, and then we've got b to the 1, and then b squared, and then b cubed, and then finally b to the fourth, right? Our a's are decreasing by 1 each step at the same time that our b's are increasing, right? a starts at n, B starts at 0, and then click, 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 until finally A is at 0 and B is at N, and we've finished our expansion in terms of the A and B exponents. The sum of the powers for each term comes out to be N. So here our N is 4. If we grab any term inside of this, we'll wind up seeing A cubed B to the 1. If we add up the powers on these terms, 3 plus 1 gets us 4. If we grab another one, like A squared B squared, 2 plus 2 gets us 4. Even at the extremes, well, A to the 0 and B to the 4th, well, 4 plus 0 gets us 4. This winds up happening with a plus b to the fifth as well. If we grab any one of the terms here, this is a 4. 
This is a one, four plus one gets us five. So if we add the powers, we always wind up getting n, whatever our a plus b to the n is, adding the powers of the a and the b will always come out to be n to give us the value of n. And finally, the coefficients vary symmetrically. There's symmetry in how the coefficients are, right? If we start in the middle, there's a six here by itself because it's in the very middle, so it can't be symmetric with anybody else. And then we have fours matching on either side. And then we have ones, effectively the coefficient here is a one because it doesn't appear at all, so its coefficient is one. And the ones match on either side as well. Same thing here, the tens match and the fives match and the invisible ones match. Right? So we wind up seeing the coefficients vary symmetrically. Great. With all these ideas in mind, these properties, we see that any expansion of a binomial a plus b to the n is going to have this form of a to the n, a to the n minus 1, a to the n minus 2, until we finally work down to a squared a, and then just a to the 0 in here. And we reverse that with the b's. We have b to the 0 at the beginning, and then it works up b to the 1, b squared, working out b to the n minus 2, b to the n minus 1, and b to the n finally. So we're always going to have this form. The only question is, what goes in the blanks in front of it? We call these blanks binomial coefficients because they're the coefficients of the binomial expansion, right? They're the number multiplying against that binomial having been expanded, each one of the coefficients for the expansion of some a, some b, powers on those a and b's. So the only question we have at this point is, what will those coefficients be? We get this with the binomial theorem. If we want to know the binomial coefficients of some binomial expansion, we can use the binomial theorem. So the binomial theorem says expanding some a plus b to the n, the coefficient of the term a to the n minus k, b to the k, will be n choose k equals, and n choose k is just the same thing as n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial. Remember, we talked about this n choose k, this parentheses with the number n and the number, well, the values n and k above each other. This is n choose k. We've talked about this before. You can also write it as n c k or c of n comma k, but we still pronounce all of these spoken aloud the same way, n choose k. We first learned about this idea in the lesson permutations and combinations. So if you really want a lot more uh, experience with how that works, you can go look that up. But really, we've got enough just for what we're looking for here from what we'll be able to get in just this lesson. Also remember, the exclamation mark means factorial. And factorial is the value we get when we multiply a number by all the positive integers below it. So for example, 5 factorial is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We multiply those all together, and we get the value of 5 factorial. Finally, we define 0 factorial equal to 1. We just say 0 factorial equals 1. That's the end of the story because it will help us out. It makes things easier, and there's also some other fiddly reasons that we don't really need to go into. Just you have to memorize 0 factorial equals 1, and that's just that. All right. So let's see the binomial theorem get used in example so we can see how it works. So for any a plus b to the n, the coefficient of the a n minus k b k term is n choose k, which is the same thing as saying n factorial divided by n minus k factorial times k factorial. For example, if we had a plus b to the seventh and we wanted to know the term containing a squared b to the fifth when expanded, right? That's going to show up because 2 plus 5 is 7, so we know a squared plus b to the fifth will show up in the expansion. So we could figure out what the term would be with the binomial theorem. We know it's going to be n choose k. So the only thing we have to do is figure out what is our n? Well, it's a plus b to the seventh, so it means n equals 7. What is our k? Well, it's b to the fifth. So our k equals 5, right? a to the n minus k, b to the k. We can also check because it's n minus k here, and this is 2. Well, if we take 7 minus 5, sure enough, we get 2, which is this value right here. So it checks out. We're following the method of the binomial theorem. We see how the binomial theorem works, right? We've got a to the 7 minus 5 times b to the 5. That's a squared b to the fifth. We know that the coefficient is going to be n choose k, so our n is 7, our k is 5, so we've got 7 choose 5. That expands to 7 factorial divided by 2 factorial times 5 factorial times a squared b to the fifth. 
and that will simplify to 21 times a squared b to the fifth. So we've been able to figure out what the coefficient is, what the term would look like when it's fully expanded, we get 21 a squared b to the fifth. If you're not quite sure how we get the value of 21 out of that, we can figure it out because 7 choose 5, well, we wrote here already that'd be 7 factorial divided by 7 minus 5, so that's 2 factorial, times 5, so 5 factorial. 7 factorial is the same thing as 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But we can also write 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 as it's just 5 factorial. And hey, now we've got things we can cancel out. 2 factorial is just 2 times 1, so we can just leave that as 2. So it's 2 times 5 factorial. We've got 5 factorial, 5 factorial, they cancel out. 7 times 6 over 2. 6 cancels into 3 times 2, so our 2's cancel out. We've got 7 times 3, or 21, and that's so we wind up getting the 21 for our coefficient. And we know it will be a squared b to the fifth because we figured out that it was the coefficient of the a squared b to the fifth term. Great. So at this point, we can now know the coefficient of any term, which means that we can expand a plus b to the n with relative ease. a plus b to the n will wind up being n choose 0, a to the n, because it's a k of 0 there, because b hasn't even shown up, so it's b to the 0. And then next we'd have n choose 1, a to the n minus 1, b to the 1, right? Our k there is 1. Next we'd have n choose 2 times a to the n minus 2, b to the 2. And we'd continue on in this fashion that we have n choose n minus 2. So n minus n minus 2 comes out to be positive 2, right? n minus n minus 2. So the minus on the minus 2 becomes positive when we get just positive 2 on our a. And k is n minus 2 means b to the n minus 2. n choose n minus 1, a to the a times b to the n minus 1. And finally, n choose n. It's now a to the n minus n, or a to the 0, so it just disappears, and b to the n. So we can now expand out the whole thing with relative ease, right? It'll definitely still take some effort. We'll have to figure out what each of these choose values comes out to be, but we can write the whole thing out expanded, and we'll be able to get it out. And it will still be easier than doing each term and then multiplying a plus b and a plus b and a plus b and a plus b and trying to foil the whole thing. Expanding factors like that would just be a real pain if it was a large thing like a plus b to the tenth. So this is really useful if we're trying to expand a very large exponent n. Also, we can condense this in a really nice way. We can, so this is a monster of an expansion, right? It would be a pain if we had to write this repeatedly. So we can use good old sigma or summation notation to condense this into a much smaller thing. a plus b to the n is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k times a to the n minus k b to the k. If you want to check that, make sure that works. Well, if we plug in k equals 0, sure enough, we wind up getting this term, right? n choose 0, a to the n minus 0, that's a to the n, b to the 0, it just disappears, so we wind up getting that. And we work all the way through. Here would be k equals n n choose n, a to the n minus n, b to the n, we wind up getting n choose n, b to the n, and we wind up seeing all of the terms here show up. There would be k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3 next, k equals 4, until we finally get to k equals n minus 2, k equals n minus 1, k equals n. So we can write the whole thing with sigma summation notation. If this is really confusing, if you really haven't done much work with sigma sum summation notation, remember to check out the lesson Introduction to Series. We'll talk about this. We'll have a much better understanding of sigma, so sigma, sum sigma summation notation <laughs> it's a mouthful, uh, works through. Um, so make sure you check out that lesson, that lesson if this is really confusing and you have to use it. Proof of the binomial theorem. Proving the binomial theorem is within our reach. We could prove this. It's quite challenging, but it's an interesting proof, and it will give us the chance to take our shiny new proof by induction out for a spin. We'll use proof by induction to prove this thing. Working through it will really deepen our understanding of how mathematics works. We'll get a much better understanding of how some really complicated stuff in math works by just working through it. However, proving it won't directly help us see how to use the theorem. So, if we work through it, it won't directly help us in any way for the kind of problems you're likely to have to work on right now. It will help us understand why the theorem works, but it's not likely to actually make anything easier that we actually have to do in class. As such, the proof for the binomial theorem is in this lesson. It is here, but it's at the end after the examples. So it's after the examples. If you're interested, I encourage you, go ahead, check it out. It's some cool stuff. You'll get the chance to really flex your math muscles. We're basically going to be looking at a college level proof, but I believe that if you're interested in this sort of thing and you put a little bit of effort into watching it and working through it, you'll totally be able to understand it. So if you're interested in this kind of math, go ahead, check it out. It's a really cool thing. We'll spend a while working through it and explaining it carefully. 
But at the same time, if you're busy or you don't really care, you're not that interested in math, you're just working through this so that you can get a grade in your class, well, I'd like for you to be interested in math, but hey, I'm not going to be able to always make you interested in math, so I just want you to do well. But to be honest, you don't actually have to understand how this proof works to do well in a math class at this level or even the next level. This is more something for if you think you might be really interested in serious math or serious level science courses, you probably want to check this out. But, you know, in that's still even going to be a couple years out if you're currently in a pre-calc class like this. All right, so check it out if you're interested, but if you're not, don't sweat it. Pascal's triangle. We can arrange the binomial coefficients in a triangular pattern to call thing to make a thing called Pascal's triangle, named after one of the people to have found it and discovered it. So we can have n equals 0 as our first row, well, the zeroth row we'll call it, n equals 1 as the next row, the first row, n equals 2 as the next row, what we'll call the second row, n equals 3, n equals 4, and so on and so on. So notice we've got our n value at the top each time, so n equals 0 and then n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on and so on. And then we always have 0, and then 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, until it finally winds up having the number on top match the number on bottom, and that's how we wind up making the triangle. So why is this interesting? We're going to see a really interesting pattern emerge when we replace each n choose k. So we replace each of these guys like this with what the value winds up coming out of it. What does 2 choose 0 come out to be? We replace it, we start to see a pattern emerge. So we replace it and we wind up getting this. n equals 0 gets 1 for its row. n equals 1 gets 1 and 1. n equals 2 gets 1, 2, 1. n equals 3, 1, 3, 3, 1. n equals 4, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. You might have seen this before. Notice how each row can be created from the row above through diagonal addition of the terms. So for example, if we go out from n equals 0, we go out diagonal left, diagonal right, 1 added down would wind up getting us 1 and 1. Then, if we add diagonally again, down left, down right, and then the same thing for the other guy, down left, down right, well, 1 plus only by itself would come out as 1. 1 plus 1 would get us 2, right? It's this guy and this guy combined together because it has both of the diagonals coming in through here. And then one only on itself would get us one here. And we can keep going along with this pattern. One diagonally out, two diagonally out, one diagonally out. One just by itself would get one. One plus two would get us three. Two plus one would get us three. One by itself would get us one. We can keep going in this pattern. One on itself would get one. One on three, four, three on three, six, three on one, four, three on, uh, sorry, one by itself, one. So by doing this, we can extend the triangle down to whatever value of n we're interested in considering. So if we're interested, so whatever value of n we're interested in considering, we can just get through, get to by diagonal addition of terms. So for example, if we're interested in knowing what n equals 5, then we just expand out diagonally like this, right, through diagonal addition, and we can work it out. 1 added to itself just gets 1. 1 added to 4 gets us 5. 4 added to 6 gets us 10. 6 added to 4 gets us 10. 4 added to 1 gets us 5. 1 added to itself gets us 1. And we've been able to create the row n equals 5, the fifth row. Since the first row is based off of n equals 0, it is called the zeroth row. So here is the zeroth row. This will help keep us from having confusion later on. The next row is called the first row because it's based off of n equals 1. So here is the first row, right? We might think that the first row would be the one on top, but not with Pascal's triangle because it's really based off of n equals 0 and then n equals 1. So second row would be the one connected to n equals 2. So it's based on the number of the n, not the actual location of the row so much as if you were just counting location of row. It's based on the n that it's connected to. n equals 4 would produce the fourth row, and so on and so forth. So why do we care about Pascal's triangle? Why is this thing useful? Because the nth row gives the coefficients to expanding a plus b to the n, right? Well, the way we set this up in the first place was by using those binomial coefficients. Remember all those binomial coefficients, the n choose k, we had that set up based off of which n we were on. So what we did was we put down all the binomial coefficients for a given n value, which means what a plus b to the n is. So we've just talked about all the coefficients for expanding some a plus b to the n. So it's really handy if we have to expand the entire thing. 
So for example, since the nth row gives the coefficients to expanding a plus b to the n, we can expand x plus y to the fourth using the triangle. So if it's x plus y to the fourth, then that means we're dealing with n equals 4, so we care about this row of the triangle. So we work this out, and that means it's going to be x plus y to the fourth. Well, we know it's going to be some blank, and it will start off with x to the fourth, y to the zero, plus blank x to the three, y to the one, right? y goes up by one, x goes down by one plus blank x squared, y squared, plus blank x to the 1, y cubed, plus blank x to the 0, y to the 4th. So at this point, we can now plug in each of our binomial coefficients. A 1 will go here, 4 here, 6 here, 4 here, 1 here. And we can also write the thing a little bit simpler, right? 1 x to the 4th, y to the 0. Well, 1, we normally don't write a coefficient of 1. So we can just write this as x to the 4th, because y to the 0 also just turns into a 1. We don't normally write out the 1s. So x to the 4th plus 4 x cubed y to the 1. We normally just write that as y, so we can write that like that. Plus 6 x squared y squared plus 4 x to the 1. Normally just write it as x y cubed plus 1 x to the 0. Well, 1 is normally don't write 1s. x to the 0, that's just x to the 0 becomes 1, so it will disappear as well. And we're left with just y to the 4th. So we wind up being able to expand all of x plus y to the fourth using Pascal's triangle, which tells us the binomial coefficients for the associated n row. We can use that triangle and we can expand things pretty easily, right? If we had tried to expand x plus y to the fourth by hand, we'd probably still be doing it. It would be take, it takes a while. And this was even through explaining it, right? If we were just punching it out, we'd be able to do this really quickly. So Pascal's triangle is really useful for when we have to expand some binomial quickly and easily without having to take a whole bunch of time. Pretty useful. All right, we're ready for some examples. Use the binomial theorem to give the coefficients for the term containing s4 t to the 7 from s plus t to the 11th. So s plus t to the 11th, first thing we want to identify is we want to identify what's the n we're working with. The n we're working with is 11. 11. All we care about is s4 t to the 7, right? We're asked to find the coefficient the binomial coefficient for that term when we expand s plus t to the 11th. So we don't really care about all of the other terms. All we care about is s4 t to the 7th. So what's that going to be? That's going to wind up being some n choose k. And if we wanted to have that, it would also be s to the 4 t to the 7th. So really at this point, all we need to find is what is k. So k is what? Well, right, it's normally from the binomial theorem, we would have n choose k, a to the n minus k, b to the k. So in this case, we've got n choose k, but we're not using a and b, we're using s and t. So it will be s to the n minus k, t to the k. What's our n? So we've got 11 choose k times s to the 11 minus k, t to the k. Well, if we've got t to the seventh, and s to the fourth, then it must be that k has to be equal to 7, right? 11 minus 7 gets us 4, and k equals 7 gets us t to the seventh. So we now know what k is, we now know what n is, so we can plug this in. So we've got 11 choose 7 times s to the fourth t seventh will be the s to the fourth t seventh term. What comes out to be 11 choose 7? Let's go do that in a sidebar. So 11 choose 7, well that's going to be 11 factorial, over 11 minus 7, 4 factorial, times 7 factorial. 11 factorial, well, we can write that as 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times blah, 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 blah. But we can also just write as times 7 factorial now. Hey, that's convenient because we got 7 factorial on the bottom. So 4 factorial times 7 factorial. We cancel out the 7 factorials. We've got 11 times 10 times 9 times 8. The bottom, we can expand 4 factorial as 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We'll just leave the 1 off. 2 cancels, and 2 and 4 become 8, which cancels the 8 on top. 3 cancels with part of the 3 of the 9, so we have times 3 because we cancel out one of the 3s from the 9. 11 times 10 times 3 comes out to be 330. So 330 is our coefficient, so we get 330 times s to the 4th t to the seventh is what we get as the coefficient of the term containing s to the fourth t to the seventh. The coefficient is just the 330 part, and the whole 
uh, whole term would be 330 times s to the fourth t to the seventh when we expand s plus t to the eleventh. Now, could you imagine how difficult that would be to do by hand? Right, that'd be practically impossible for us to do by hand because it would take so much time and effort. But by using this n choose k business, we're able to figure out what the coefficient is relatively easy. Use the binomial theorem to give the coefficient for the term containing x to the tenth, y to the twelfth from x squared plus y cubed to the ninth. So first thing I want to point out, x to the tenth, y to the twelfth. Well, what we talked about before was if you take the exponents and you add them together, well, what is our n? Our n here is n equals 9. But if we add 10 and 12 together, 10 plus 12 is 22. So what? Wait, that doesn't make sense. What's going on here? The issue isn't that it's x to the tenth, y to the twelfth, because what we really have is it's a and b. But what is our a and b? Our a and b is x squared and y cubed. So a equals x squared, b equals y cubed. So it's a plus b to the ninth. So when we expand this out, what we're looking at is n choose k on a squared, sorry, a to the n minus k, a to the n minus k, b to the k. But now we've called out a and b as x squared and y cubed, right? Because that's what the actual two terms of it are. It's not just x and it's not just y. It's x squared and y cubed. So we've got some n, choose k. We'll plug those in later. And so it's x squared to the n minus k. And b, what's b? b is y cubed to the k. So now we need to figure out what values does k have to be for us to, what value does k have to be for us to be able to get x10, y12? Well, if we've got y to the 3 to the k, and we know that winds up being the same thing as y to the 12th, well then k has to be equal to 4, right? Because y to the 3 to the 4th would be 3 times 4, so y to the 12th. So we wind up getting y to the 12th from setting k equal to 4. And similarly, 9 minus 4 right, since it's a to the n minus k here, so 9, our n value here, minus 4, our k value here, would get us 5 for n minus k, and x squared to the fifth does come out to be 10, x to the 10, right, 2 times 5 is 10. So at this point, we now see what our k is, our k is 4, our n is 9, so we can plug those in, and what we're looking at is 9 choose 4 times x squared to the n minus k, so in this case 5, y to the 3 to the 4th, y to the 3 to the 4th, so x squared to the 5, that does become 10, y to the 3 to the 4th, that does become 12, and 5 and 4 put together does become 9, so everything checks out, this makes sense. At this point we only need to figure out what is 9 choose 4, so 9 factorial over 9 minus 4, the top minus the bottom, so that's 5 factorial times just the bottom factorial. So 9 factorial, well we can write that as 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 factorial over 5 factorial, hey look, that's convenient, they cancel, times 4, and now let's expand 4 factorial as well, 4 times 3 times 2, we'll omit the 1 because it doesn't do anything, 5 factorial, 5 factorial, they cancel, 3 and 2, they cancel out the 6, 8 cancels with a 4 to make a 2 on top, so we've got 9 times 2 times 7. 9 times 2 times 7 comes up to be 126, so there's our coefficient right there. Or if we wanted to write out the whole thing, we'd wind up getting 126 times x not to the fifth, not to the squared, but x to the tenth, what it was because it said the term containing x to the tenth, y to the twelfth. Not the one where we've raised that part of the binomial to the fifth, but x to the tenth, y to the twelfth, x10, y12. And the coefficient, what it asked for was the coefficient, so the coefficient is 126 times x10, y12. Great. Third example, find the value of the coefficient c on the term c x to the eighth in the expansion of 2x squared minus 3 to the seventh. So once again, we need to realize this is 8, but what we've got is an n equals 7. Right, n equals 7. So we realize, oh right, it's 2x squared. That's the thing we're dealing with. So we've got a equals 2x squared and b equals not just 3, but it has to be including the negative as well, because it, what, normally it's a plus b. So if it's a plus b normally, but now it's a minus b, then it must be that the b also has a negative inside of it. So our b is equal to negative 3. 
Okay, so at this point we want to figure out what number do we have to raise 2x squared to to get x to the 8th to pop out of that. So what number do we raise that to? So if we've got x squared, we'll consider just the x squared for a moment because the 2 won't affect how many, what exponent the x has. So x squared to the question mark is equal to x to the 8th. Well, then our question mark has to be 4 because 2 times 4 comes out to be 8. So x squared raised to the 4 equals x to the 8. So we know whenever we do this expansion, n choose k times 2x squared, our whole a, to the n minus k times our whole b, negative 3, to the k. Now we need to figure out what is our k. Well, our n was 7 right? Our n is 7, so our k must be 3 if we're going to produce a 4 there, right? n minus k has to be 4 because we know this value here has to match up with n minus k here. So n minus k there has to match up as well. So our 7 is what we have for n. So 7 minus k equals 4. 7 minus k equals 4 means k has to be 3. So now we've figured out that k has to be 3. We're ready to plug everything in. So n choose k, 7 choose 3 times 2x squared to the n minus k comes out to be 4, negative 3 to the 3. So n minus k at 4, 2x squared to the 4th. Sure enough, that would make some constant times x to the 8th. Negative 3 to the 3, that's just going to also be part of that constant term c. So at this point, let's figure out what it is. Let's solve 7 choose 3, 7 choose 3. What does that value come out to be? 7 factorial over 7 minus 3, 4 factorial times 3 factorial. So we've got 7 times 5 times 6 cancels out. Sorry, 7 times 6 times 5. Not sure why I confused that order. Doesn't matter, but I don't want to make you think something weird happened. 7 times 6 times 5 over 4 factorial canceled out with all of the rest of those. And we've got 3 factorial on the bottom is just 3 times 2 times 1. We'll omit that. 3 times 2 cancels out with the 6. 7 times 5 gets us 35. So we can now swap that in for our 7 choose 3, and we've got 35 times 2x squared becomes 2 to the 4th x squared to the 4th. 2 to the 4th is 16. x squared is x to the 8th. Negative 3 cubed is negative 27, right? Negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3. We use a calculator to multiply 35, 16, and negative 27, and we get negative 15,120 x to the 8. So that means our c must be equal to negative 15,120, because what we're looking for was the coefficient c on the expansion of cx to the 8th once the thing is fully expanded. All right, great. Ready to move on to Pascal's triangle. The fourth example, use Pascal's triangle to expand p minus q to the 6th. So if we're going to the 6th, then that means n equals 6. We're going to have to get down to the 6th row, which is really the seven, the row that is 7 down. Um, right, if we say that the first the row at the very top is 1 down, but we'll just write n equals 0 so we don't get confused by this. So our first row, n equals 0. All right, 0th row, sorry. 0th row is at a 1, and then n equals 1. Next one, 1, 1. n equals 2. 1, 2, 1. n equals 3. 1, 3. Uh, 3, 1. n equals 4. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1 n equals 5, 1, 1 plus 4, 5, 4 plus 6, 10, 6 plus 4, 10, 4 plus 1, 5, 1 on itself, 1. And finally, the one we care about, n equals 6, 1 on itself, 1, 1 plus 5, 6, 5 plus 10, 15, 10 plus 10, 20, 10 plus 5, 15, 5 plus 1, 6, 1 on itself, 1. Those are all of the coefficients that we care about at this expansion. All right, so if we're going to expand p minus q to the sixth, we know that it's going to wind up having some expansion that looks like blank this guy first. Well, this guy's p, and this guy, though, is actually negative q. So it's going to be blank p to the sixth times negative q to the zeroth, right? And then we work the q part up and the p part down one step at a time. So p to the 6th becomes p to the 5th on our next step. Negative q to the 0 becomes negative q to the 1 
plus blank p to the 4, negative q to the 2. I'm going to just continue on the next line, plus p to the 3 times negative q to the 3. Oh, there should be a blank in front of that plus, sorry, before, after, right here. Plus blank p squared negative q to the 4 plus, I'll just break this down to the next line once again, plus blank p to the 1 negative q to the 5th plus blank p to the 0th negative q to the 6th. Great. At this point, we can now swap in our values for our binomial coefficients. We know a 1 will go here, a 6 will go here, a 15 will go here, a 20 will go here, a 15 will go here, a 6 will go here, a 1 will go here. See how they come in, they come in symmetrically? So at this point, we'll now write it all on this line around here. And we'll also simplify it. So 1, p to the 6th, negative q to the 0. Well, 1, that just disappears. We've got p to the 6th and negative q to the 0, where you raise anything in the 0, and it just becomes 1. So we'll have that disappear as well. 6, p to the 5th, negative q to the 1. Well, that negative q is going to show up now. It's going to come in. So it's not plus. It's now minus, because it's negative q to the 1. So minus 6, p to the 5th, q, right? That negative q here doesn't get canceled out, because it's just 1 negative. And next we'll have plus 15 p to the fourth, negative q squared, negative on negative cancels out, so we do have positive q squared, plus 20 p cubed minus q, sorry, times negative q to the cube, negative, negative, negative means we still have negative, so it's not a plus, it's a minus because of the negative q cubed, so we've got q cubed. <laughs> Um, next, plus 15, that was the last one, this is what we're working on now, 15 p squared negative q to the fourth. Well, the negatives will wind up canceling there because it's an even number q to the fourth. Plus 6 p to the one negative q to the fifth. Well, negative q to the fifth, that's an odd, so it will be minus 6 p times q to the fifth. And then finally, negative q to the sixth, a coefficient of 1. Our very last term, we just did this one here as our last term, 1, p to the 0, those things both disappear, and we have plus q to the 6, and the negative disappears because it has an even exponent. Great. And there is our full expansion. Right? Still not super fast, but it's way, way better than if we had tried to expand that whole thing out by hand. If we did that whole thing by hand, it'd be taking forever, but this goes relatively quickly by using Pascal's triangle. Final example, use Pascal's triangle to expand the square root of 3 u squared plus 1 half root p to the fourth. So at this point, what is our n? Our n equals 4, so we need to get down to the n equals 4 row. We start at n equals 0, 1, n equals 1, 1, 1, n equals 2, 1, 2, 1, n equals 3, 1, 3, 3, 1, n equals 4. Finally, the row that we actually care about, 1, 4, uh, sorry, 6, 3 plus 3 is 6, 3 plus 1, 4, and 1. Great. So that's the row that we will actually wind up using because our n equals 4. So that we don't wind up getting cramped, I'm not going to wind up writing here. I'm going to wind up doing the expansion down here. So our first thing will be some blank times, well, what's our a? That's the good thing to identify. Root 3 u squared is what our a is equal to, right? a plus b to the sum n. So in this case, the a is all of root 3 u squared, and the b is all of 1 half root p. Okay, so we're now ready to do this. So the first one will be root 3 u squared to the n equals 4, and then 1 half root p to the 0, so I won't even write that one there, plus blank root 3u squared to the 3 times 1 half root p to the 1, plus blank root 3u squared squared times 1 half root p squared, plus blank, let me break that down to the next line just so we can have plenty of room, plus blank root 3u squared to the 1, times 1 half root p to the 3 plus blank root 3 u squared times 1 half oh, to the 0. So we can just disappear that entire thing. 
times one half root p all to the four. Great. So I want you to notice here, don't get confused by the fact that it's u squared or root p. The fact that there's exponents on stuff inside of the binomial doesn't matter. We still do this, this part where the one exponent steps down with each step and the other exponent, the one that starts at zero, steps up with each step of the terms that we work through. Great. At this point, we can now plug in our binomial coefficients. So a 1 for our first blank, a 4 for the next blank, a 6 for the next blank, a 4 for the next blank, and a 1 for our final blank. At this point, we can now finally actually simplify this guy. Well, let's do it in two steps. So 1, we'll just have that disappear. Root 3, u squared to the fourth. Well, root 3 squared is 3, so root 3 to the fourth is 3 squared. So root 3 to the fourth is the same thing as 9. u squared to the fourth is u to the eighth plus four times root three cubed is going to be three root three. U squared cubed is u to the sixth. One half root p to the one is just one half root p. Plus six root three squared, u, sorry, root three u squared squared. Root three squared is three. U squared squared is u to the fourth. Plus, sorry, times one half root p squared will be one over four, right? One half squared is one half times one half, so one over four. Root p squared is p. Break the line once again. Plus, next is four. Root three u squared to the one. Well, that just stays as root three u squared times one half root p cubed. One half to the three is one over eight times root p cubed is p root p. And then finally, plus 1 times 1 half root p to the fourth is going to be 1 over 16. Root p to the fourth is going to come out as p squared. Great. Now we can simplify this whole thing. Do the last of the simplification. So 9u to the 8 plus 4 times 3 root 3 times 1 half. So 1 half cancels the 4 down to a 2 we're left with 6 root 3 u to the 6th root p plus we've got 1 quarter here, so this will become 1 half. This will become 3. 6 times 1 quarter becomes 3 times 1 half. So 3 times 3 is 9 divided by 2. We've got 9 over 2 is the coefficient there. u to the 4th p plus 4 root 3 times 4 root 3 u squared 1 8 p root p. Hoi, lots a lot of things. So 1 8th, that'll cancel the 2 when it knocks out this 4. And so we've got root 3 over 2 u squared p root p. And finally, our last term, 1 16th p squared. And there is the full expansion. It's about as difficult as any... Uh, any expansion the Pascal's triangle will wind up being, but still notice how much faster that wound up making it than if we had tried to do this whole thing by hand of doing root 3 u squared plus 1 half root p times root 3 u squared plus 1 half root p times root 3 u squared plus 1 half root p times root 3 u squared plus 1 half root p. We'd still be working through it and we'd still have a lot more to go. So it makes things faster. We have to be careful and make sure that we, you know, there's a couple things we have to pay attention to. We really have to make sure that our n, the row that we're using the Pascal's triangle, matches to the exponent we're raising to. We have to pay attention to to what is our whole A, what is our whole B, right? It has to be the entire term, not just the U, not just the P, but the entire term of something plus something. And if it's a minus, it has to be something plus a negative something. And then we set it up with this step down, step up pattern, the blanks, and then we can just slot everything in. If it's a simpler problem, you might be able to do it without having to take such careful steps. But if it's a big, complicated uh, problem, I really recommend do the careful steps. It'll make it easy to not make a mistake and make the problem uh, just a slow cakewalk. All right, cool. So that finishes up for the examples. If you're heading out now, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye. But if you're sticking around for the, uh, for the theorem, for the proof of the theorem, it's time for the bonus round. All right, so we're ready to tackle a proof of the binomial theorem. First, let's phrase the theorem as for any n equals 0, 1, 2, and so on and so on. So that is all natural numbers. 
a plus b to the n is equal to the sum, going from k equals 0 to n, of n choose k times a to the n minus k, b to the k. So notice that's just putting all of the binomial coefficients added together for a fully expanded term. We're going to prove this by induction. So just in case you haven't watched the previous lessons but you're really interested in this proof, we'll be using mathematical induction. And we'll also be using a fair bit of sigma that is summation notation. So if you're not familiar with mathematical induction or sigma summation notation, watch the lesson on mathematical induction and watch the lesson on intro to series where we'll talk about sigma summation notation because those things will definitely be necessary prerequisites. And before we get into this, I really want to stress what we're about to go through is a pretty challenging proof. This is straight up a college level proof for a reasonably good math class. So don't, don't be shocked if you find this a little bit challenging to work through. This isn't going to be super easy to understand the first time, and that's perfectly okay. Math is a puzzle to be worked through and understood over time. So watch through this. If you have difficulty understanding what's going on moment to moment, I highly recommend take a piece of paper and actually write what's happening on screen as we're working through it in the lesson. By working through it yourself, you'll be able to understand the steps better because you'll have to internalize them because you yourself will have to be uh, understanding and working through it. If at some point a step happens where you have no idea how that step happens, pause the video and try to understand what just happened on your paper. Figure out how you can get from one step to the next step. If you still can't figure it out, back it up. Hopefully I'll explain it through it. I'll explain a lot of this. We'll be working through it slowly and carefully. But um, a really great trick is to work through it on paper. Hopefully, it really makes things make a lot more sense just getting it down on paper so it's not just rattling around in your head. You can actually see it, think about it, have it in front of you. It's a really great way to work. I really recommend this anytime you're trying to work through a math textbook and things get confusing in the math textbook. Just take a piece of scratch paper and write what's going on in the math textbook. Writing it out for yourself, understanding it step by step when you write it out in your own hand will wind up making most issues that you wind up having will wind up clearing up so much faster because you're having to work through it yourself. You're not just trying to read someone else's language, you're putting it in your own language before you're, before you're moving on. All right, let's get started. This one's, this is really good. This is what math is really about, in my opinion. Uh, math lets us do all sorts of things, but for me, math, the cool thing about math is the fact that it's puzzles, that it's logic, it's something that we can believe in and is just like there. Real logic, real proof, this stuff actually comes together and can be shown very clearly. All right, let's get to it. Proof by induction. Begin by noticing how nicely the theorem lends itself to being written as some pn statement, some statement for some value of n, right? We've got n equals 0, 1, 2, so it's just stepping up one at a time, and a plus b to the n equals this sum here is what the binomial theorem says. So we can just say the nth statement is a plus b to the n equals that sum. Great, really easy to write out in this statement idea. Our base case, now before we prove the base case, notice that there's this slight issue. The theorem doesn't start at n equals 1, it starts at n equals 0. When we first talked about mathematical induction, we always set our base case at n equals 1. But with this one, we can't set our base case at n equals 1. We actually need to start at p0. So not p1, but p0, because the theorem starts at n equals 0. If we think about this, though, we realize this isn't really an issue. It's just that we need a starting point to work out, right? It needs to be the first stepping stone that we then walk forward from using that inductive step. That's what the inductive step is, is that's taking one step after another and guaranteeing that future stepping stones will be there as long as we have this first stepping stone. So it doesn't really matter if the stepping stone starts at n n equals 0, or starts at n equals 15, or starts at n equals 1, it just needs to be some integer value that we can then step forward from. So n equals 0 is a perfectly fine thing to set our base case at. We work through this. A base case of p0 would wind up giving us a plus b to the 0. Is that equal to, right, we're saying as a question, we don't know if this is true yet, we're checking to make sure the two sides are true, would be equal to the sum, if this is true, of k equals 0, summed to 0 of 0, choose k, a to the 0 minus k, b to the k, right? So our left side, well, a plus b to the 0, anything raised to 0, that just comes out to be 1. Our sum, k equals 0, going up to 0, well, that means that where we start is where we stop. So there's only one term in this series. When we expand the summation, when we expand the sigma notation, it just turns into 0 choose 0, right? We plug in our k, we plug in the k here, so 0 minus 0, and plug in the k here, b to the 0. 
So what does that come out to be? Well, a to the 0 minus 0, that just comes out to be 1. b to the 0, that just comes out to be 1. 0 choose 0, well, that's going to be 0 factorial over 0 minus 0 factorial, so 0 factorial, times 0 factorial. So we've got this guy here, 0 factorial over 0 factorial times 0 factorial. Well, 0 factorial, remember, when we set up 0 factorial, we just stated 0 factorial equals 1. We simply define it that way. So that means 0 factorial over 0 factorial times 0 factorial. Hey, that turned out to be 1. So our entire left side is 1. Our entire, sorry, our entire right side is 1. 1. Our entire left side is 1, as we already figured out early on. So that means, indeed, this does check out. The base case is true. We're good on the base case. Yay. On to the inductive step. Now, here's, here's where things get a little bit tricky, just for understanding notation-wise. There's a minor issue with notation here. So when we first saw induction, we always had some general statement pn, right? This a plus b to the n equals stuff. Now, what we did for the inductive step was we assumed, we said, if pk is true, then we have to show pk plus 1 is true, right? If this thing is true, then the next guy must be true. But we've got this problem. The way we usually write binomial, the binomial theorem, we use k, right? k shows up as the index and the sum. We're using this all over. So we can't not use pk, right? This means we cannot use pk if we use, if we use pk. So if we use pk, we'll wind up having to re-index and change around variables. So we cannot use pk without re-indexing and changing around variables, right? If we had to use pk and then pk plus 1, we'd have to come up with some new variable to swap out for all of these k's up here. And then it would get confusing because it's not how we were already used to winding up working with the theorem. And so it's going to change its ways. And it just makes things confusing. So what we're going to do to avoid confusing ourselves with new variables, so to avoid confusion, we're going to prove the following for the step. If pn is true for some n, then we will show that pn plus 1 is true as well. So up here, this is the general statement of pn, and we're trying to show that it's true for all n, right? Any natural number n is what we're trying to show for our general statement. But what we're going to do is we're going to say that, sure, let's assume it's true for some specific n. We don't need to name what that specific is, but it's just one value of n. And then we're going to show that if it's true for that one value, it has to be true for the next value, n plus 1 as well. So this is OK. Right Before we talked about pk and then pk plus 1, but it doesn't really matter what symbol we use. All that matters is that if it's true at one step, it must be true at the next step. Right? If it's true here, it has to be true at the next step. Right? If it's true at pk, it has to be true at pk plus 1. If it's true at pz, it has to be true at pz plus 1. If it's true at pn, it has to be true at pn plus 1. That's different than our general statement of it's true for all n forever. We're saying, let's say it's true for some specific n, and then let's show that it has to be true for the next guy in, in line. This might be a little bit confusing, but really it's okay to wind up using this pn and pn plus 1, because what we're not doing is we're not saying, we're not assuming it's always true for all n, we're just saying, let's say it's true for some n, and then we'll show what would happen for the next n, n plus 1. And that's what we'll do to avoid having to get all this notation confusion of having to use letters other than n, of having to use letters other than k, because then it would be not what we're used to seeing, and while we could work through it, it makes it a lot easier if it's something that we're used to seeing, used to working with. So we'll wind up avoiding notation confusion by keeping keeping n and k in this and just sort of knowing what's going on on a personal level. All right, we're ready to actually work through this. So let's set, set this up. For our inductive step, we start off by assuming our inductive hypothesis. We assume that for some n, pn is true. That is, a plus b to the n is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k times a to the n minus k times b to the k. Now, what we want to show is that p to the n plus 1 must also be true if p to the n is true. So assuming p to the n, p n and 1 plus 1 must be true. That's what we are working towards. We don't know it yet, we're working towards it. So how would p to the n plus, sorry, how would p n plus 1 be stated? Well, that'd be stated as a plus b raised to the n plus 1 equals, and now we swap out the n here for n plus 1, n here for n plus 1, the n here for n plus 1. And that'd be the p n plus 1 version, right? Up here is the pn version. So what we want to show is that this guy here is true. Thus, if we can show that the left side 
if we can show that the left side of pn plus 1 is just the same thing as the right side, that they're just two different ways as writing the left side and the right side, that they're clearly equivalent by manipulating it through just, you know, well, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this, and they're all clearly equal, and we can make it from one side to the other side, we'll have shown that the statement is true. So if we can show that the left side is the same thing as the right, will have shown that indeed the statement is true. So what we want to do is we want to see how we can manipulate a plus b to the n plus 1. Well, in a proof by induction, we always want to toss our inductive hypothesis into this. So our first question is, is there a way to turn a plus b n plus 1 into something well, sorry, uh, into something where we can use our hypothesis. So we want to see, is there a way to turn a plus b to the n plus 1 into the right side of p n plus 1? So our first question is going to be, how can we apply our hypothesis? How can we apply p n a plus b n equals that sum? So we look at it. So if we look at a plus b to the n plus 1, well, it's pretty easy to get a plus b to the n to show up. We just split it. a plus b to the n plus 1, well, that's just the same thing as a plus b times a plus b to the n. So at this point, we can now swap out a plus b to the n for the other side of our inductive hypothesis. We swap it out. We now have a plus b times the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k, a to the n minus k, b to the k, right? We've just swapped out for our inductive hypothesis. Now, at this point, we've got a plus b over here, right? a plus b, well, we can distribute that. a plus b distributes onto that sum, and we'll have a times the sum plus b times the sum, right? a times the sum plus b times the sum. Well, a and b, they don't vary once we've expanded the thing. They just wind up being the same thing. So what we can do is we can actually bring them inside of the sum. They have no connection, no direct connection to the index, so we can bring them inside of the sum. So a will apply onto the a n minus k. So a times n minus k will be a n minus, sorry, a to the n minus k times a will be a to the n minus k plus 1, which we can write as a to the n plus 1 minus k. Same thing over here. b applied to b to the k becomes just b to the k plus 1. Great. At this point, let's expand these sigma notations, right? The sigma notations are a great way of keeping things compact, but it's a little hard to tell what's going on inside of the notation. So let's expand them so we can see what's going on better. If we expand this, we'll have k equals 0 here. We'll plug that in here first. So we'll have n choose 0 times a to the n plus 1 minus 0, so a to the n plus 1, and b to the 0, so that just disappears. And the next we'll have go up one step, n choose 1, a to the n, b, great. And we'll work our way up until finally we get up to n, and so we'll have n choose n, and it'll be a to the n plus 1 minus n when we're plugging in n. a to the n plus 1 minus n gets us just 1, right? So we've got a to the 1 here. And b to the n now, because we're swapping in n for k, and we have b to the n here. Great. So that's what we wind up getting from this sum on this side. We can do basically the same thing and expand this sum over here. We start at k equals 0. We'll get n choose 0, a to the n times b to the 1, right? If we plug in k at 0, we'll have 0 plus 1, so b to the 1. We work our way up. We get to n minus 1, 1 before our last one. n choose n minus 1. We'll have a to the n minus n minus 1. If you're not sure why that comes out, a my n minus n minus 1. Well, this becomes minus n plus 1, so we get a to the 1 here k plus 1, well, if we're plugging in n minus 1, right, we're plugging in n minus 1 for k there, n minus 1 plus 1 gets us a times b to the n. And then finally, our last one, when we plug in n, swap that in for our k, n minus k, so n minus n for our a here, will wind up just disappearing entirely. We'll have a to the 0, so we just omit that. We'll have n choose n and b plugging in k for n n plus 1 here, so we get n plus 1 here. So now we've expanded these two sums. Now we can start working with them. What we want to do first is we want to notice, hey, there's some similarities between these things. In fact, if we've got, we've got this really great similarity going on here. A and B, A and B, they match up. A, B, N, A, B, N, they match up. In fact, we'd wind up having this match up between all of the guys inside of those ellipses, right? The pattern of matching will continue throughout. The only guys who don't fit, fit this matching pattern is the guys at the far ends the a n plus 1 and the b n plus 1. So notice the only terms that don't match up of this a to the something, b to the something terms, the only ones that don't match up are the first and last terms, respectively. If we separate them out, we can relate the sums. We can have this connection. So we pull them out, n choose 0, a n plus 1, n choose n, b n plus 1 on the two n's, n is, and then we wind up having the matching going here, n choose 1, a n b, will match up to n choose 0, a n b. And then a, b, n, 
uh, sorry, n choose n a b n will match up to a b n with a choose uh, with an n choose n minus one times a b n. So we've got this nice matching going on here. So the matching will also continue in here with the same thing of the top is above the bottom by one on its bottom and above the bottom by one on its bottom every time. Great. So if that's the case, we can combine the parts in brackets, right? If a n choose b, sorry, said the wrong thing there, n choose 1, n choose 0, and they're both multiplied by a n b, well then we can combine them a n b and we wind up plugging, we wind up having n choose 1 plus n choose 0 times all of that times a and b. We pull out the a and b when we put them together. Same thing over here, n choose n, a, b, n, n choose n minus 1, a, b, n. We pull out the a, b, n, and we wind up getting n choose n plus n choose n minus 1, that quantity times a, b, n here. And inside of it, we'll wind up having the same pattern go on with the n choose something plus n choose 1 less than that something times the a, b stuff. So that pattern will wind up continuing throughout. And we've still got our guys on the end. If you're not sure how they transform from a, n plus, from n choose 0 and n choose n to just, just the a and b, well, n choose 0, that's just 1. If you're not sure about that n choose 0, well, that's equal to n factorial over n minus 0 factorial, so n factorial times 0 factorial. 0 factorial is just 1, n factorial, n factorial, they cancel out. So we wind up just getting a 1 here, so it disappears, and we're just left with a n plus 1. Exact same reasoning for n choose n becoming 1 as well on the b n plus 1, and we get b to the n plus 1 here as well. At this point, we can put this giant sum in sigma notation. So a n plus 1, that just sticks around. b n plus 1, that just sticks around. The thing we care about is this giant sum here, right, which we broke on lines because it's too much to write on a single line. So we can do that as the summation from k equals 1 to n of n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 as a quantity times a to the n plus 1 minus k times b to the k. Let's check and make sure this works. If we did indeed plug in 1, so if we plugged in k equals 1, hey, yeah, that checks out. 1 for k here, k minus 1, 1 minus 1, that does get us 0. a to the n plus 1 minus 1 would get us a to the n. b to the 1 would get us b. So that checks out there. If we were to do n, that would wind up checking out here as well. This is probably one of the hardest steps to see. But if you work through it slowly, you can see, yeah, what we're doing is this whole sum is just the same thing as what we've got in these giant brackets, this giant bracketed off portion. That's the same thing here. So we can put the whole thing in sigma notation. At this point, let's check in with our original goal. We've gotten pretty far with this thing. So what we've got is a to the n plus 1 plus the sum, big ol' sum, plus b to the n plus 1. Now compare that to what we're trying to get the whole thing to look like, right? We started off with the left side, and we're trying to get it to turn into what its right side was, and its right side was k equals 0 to n plus 1, a summation k equals 0 to n plus 1 of n plus 1 choose k times a to the n plus 1 minus k, b to the k. Hey, this stuff here, that matches really close to this. And n plus 1 k, that's not too far off from what's here. And n and k equals 1? That's not too far off either. So there's some similarities. We're starting to get there. So what would be great is if we could somehow show that what we've got here is the same thing as what we've got here, right? That n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 is just the same thing as n plus 1 choose k. If we could somehow show that that's the same thing, hey, we'd be really close to showing what we're trying to show, what we want to show, getting to our goal. So. Since that would be so useful if it were true, this n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 equals n plus 1 choose k, let's go ahead and let's try to prove it. What we'll do is we'll create a lemma. A lemma is basically just a mini theorem. So a mini theorem is something that we use, you know, something that we use to prove another larger theorem that we're interested in. It's basically sort of like a short, a thing that we can use to make a short hop to some more useful conclusion, right? It deserves being proven on its own because it's not just something we can do in a single line. But it makes sense, and it's something that we'll use towards another theorem, right? It's something we make on the way to work towards another theorem, so that's a lemma. So what we want to do is we want to show that that's true as a lemma. So our lemma is that for any natural numbers r and s, r choose s plus r choose s minus 1 is equal to r plus 1 choose s. Now, if we want to use our lemma, we have to prove anything that we want to use. This is a proof, after all, so let's get to proving it. So let's investigate the left side, r choose s plus r choose s minus 1. So we break that down, our r choose s becomes r factorial over r minus s factorial times s factorial plus 
r choose s minus 1 becomes r factorial over r plus 1 minus s factorial times s minus 1 factorial. The only thing you might be confused about is that r plus 1 minus s. Well, remember, r minus quantity s minus 1, because it's this quantity here, would wind up coming out to be, and that part will be factorial. That's what matches up here. r minus s minus 1, that becomes plus, that becomes minus, and that becomes positive. So that's why we wind up getting the r plus 1 and the minus s there. So that's how we get that. So what we want to do now is we want to get these things over a common denominator, right? Anytime we're trying to simplify work with expressions, if we've got two fractions and we're trying to show that there's something else, well, we put them together and we see what happens. So if we're going to get these over a common denominator, let's look at them for a second. Well, we've got r minus s factorial, s factorial, and r plus 1 minus s factorial, s minus 1 factorial. Well, notice r plus 1 minus s factorial is just one more than r minus s factorial, right? r minus s plus 1 is the same thing as r plus 1 minus s. Similarly, s minus 1 factorial is the same thing as 1 more going up to s. So we're trying to get s minus 1 up by 1 and r minus s up by 1, right? We want to get this guy to go up and we want to get this guy to go up. So we can get them to each increase by 1 inside of the factorial, we'll be able to have a common denominator. Now notice, based on how a factorial works, so the way a factorial works, we have the following way to increase a factorial by multiplication. x factorial times x plus 1 equals x plus 1 factorial. In case you don't see that, consider if we had 6 factorial. Well, that'd be the same thing as 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, right? Well, if we came along and we multiplied 6 by 6 plus 1, that is 7 times 6 factorial, well, that'd be the same thing as 7 times the expansion of 6 factorials, 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Well, now we've got 7 all the way down to 1, so we can write that as 7 factorial. So if we've got x factorial and we multiply it by 1 more than that x, we'll wind up increasing, we'll hop up one more step for our factorial, we'll go to x plus 1 factorial. That idea is what we will use to increase s minus 1 factorial up to s factorial, and to increase r minus s factorial up to r minus s plus 1 factorial, or r plus 1 minus s factorial. All right, so to do this, we'll multiply the left side by r plus 1 minus s over r plus 1 minus s, right? We can't just multiply the bottom. We have to multiply with a fraction on top and bottom. And we'll multiply over here by s and s because they match up to increasing s minus 1 plus 1 gets us s. r minus s plus 1 gets us r plus 1 minus s. Okay, so we work that out. On the top, r factorial times r plus 1 minus s will just be r factorial times r plus 1 minus s. On the bottom, the r minus s times one more will wind up increasing to r plus 1 minus s factorial. The s factorial remains the same. On the other side, the r factorial times s, well, that's just still r factorial times s. Can't really combine. On the bottom, though, we've got s minus 1 times s. That's s minus 1 plus 1, so that becomes s factorial. And the left side doesn't change r plus 1 minus s factorial. At this point, we've now got a common denominator. The denominator here is the exact same as the denominator here, so we can combine them. We combine them, we've got r factorial times r plus 1 minus s, r factorial times s up here. Our denominators are just the same thing because they just combine by addition. But the top, what we can do is we can pull out the r factorials. They pull out to r factorial times what the factors they were being multiplied against. So that's r plus 1 minus s and then plus s. The minus s cancels with the plus s, and we're left with r factorial times r plus 1. And hey, r plus 1 times r factorial, well, that just means it bumps up by 1. So now we've got r plus 1 factorial. We can also toss some fancy parentheses around this to help us see it. So we've got r factorial plus 1, sorry, r plus 1 factorial on the top, and r plus 1 minus s factorial times s factorial, which is just the exact same thing as r plus 1 choose s, right? r plus 1 factorial on the top times r plus 1 minus s factorial times s factorial. That's how r plus 1 choose s works. So what we've done is we've now shown the left side and the right side. The right side and the left side, they're exactly the same thing. We've set out to show that the left side and right side of our original thing, they are equivalent. Our original lemma, they're the same thing. So r choose s plus r choose s minus 1 is equal to r plus 1 choose s. We have now completed our lemma. Great. Let's go apply that lemma. So here is our lemma right here. And where were we before? Where we left off with our proof was we had a to the n plus 1 and b to the n plus 1 on the two extremes. And then the big guy that we really care about the most, the sum in the middle. Sum of k equals 1 to n of quantity n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 and quantity times a to the n plus 1 minus k times b to the k. Great. 
Whew. But at this point, we've now got that nice handy dandy lemma, handy dandy lemma. So we've got r choose s, r choose s minus one. Well, that matches up to n choose k, n choose k minus one. So we will get n plus one choose k out of it. We just used our lemma. We are on our way to wrapping this thing up, just a little bit more effort and we'll be done. So at this point, we're really, really close, right? This guy here looks practically just like what we want to show in the end. The only difference is that we need to have our upper and lower summation limits be zero and n plus one. We wanna get this guy to become a zero and we wanna get this guy to become n plus one. So how are we gonna get that to happen? Well, hmm, on the way to doing that, we also have to deal somehow with this a n plus one and this b n plus one, right? They're also in the way, they weren't in our finished thing. And, hey, maybe these things can be done together. Maybe we can somehow shove these guys into that sigma notation, shove them into the sum, and in doing so, get the zero and get the n plus one that we want to appear in that. Indeed, we can figure out a way to do that. So notice, one is equal to n plus one, choose zero. Also, one is equal to n plus one, choose n plus one. Now, you can go along and you can multiply anything you want by n, right? So since you can multiply anything by one, then we can multiply a one here and a one here. Well, we know that one is just the same thing as n plus one choose zero, so we swap that out for n plus one choose zero. And one is also just the same thing as n plus one choose n plus one, so we swap that out here as well. So now we've got something that we can mash into our summation. They fit the format of the summation, so we can fit them into the sigma notation to obtain k equals zero to n plus one, right? If we plug in k equals zero on this guy, n plus one choose k, well that'd be n plus one choose zero for k equals zero, and a plus one minus k, a plus one minus zero be a to the n plus one, b to the k, b to the zero would be guy that doesn't exist, b to the zero, right? And then same exact thing over here, if we had k equal to n plus one, then we'd have n plus one choose n plus one, a, and we'd have a to the n plus one minus, k is n plus one, so n plus one minus quantity n plus one. Well, that'd cancel a to the zero, and so we have the guy that doesn't show up here. He doesn't show up either. He just disappears. And b to the n plus one for our k. And so we see that they match in. We can pull them in. Everything else winds up staying the same. n and k equals one. They aren't affected because they do that. It's just that these guys, they fit the format of the summation. So we can pull them in on the bottom, pull them in on the top. We can fit them into the sigma notation, and we obtain this. We've managed to show what we were trying to show from the beginning. So after much effort, we have finally shown that assuming our inductive hypothesis, so assuming Pn, we now know that Pn plus 1 is true. That is, a plus b to the n plus 1 is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n plus 1 of n plus 1 choose k times a to the n plus 1 minus k times b to the k. That checks out. We have finished showing our inductive step. So at this point, we know that the base case is true. We showed that from the beginning, and we've now finished showing that the inductive step is true. So with some Pn, we know that Pn n plus one must be true. So since that works as our inductive step, we now know, combining that with our base case, that pn is true for all n. In other words, for any n equal to zero, one, two, dot, 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 we have the binomial theorem completely finished proving. We have finished proving the binomial theorem. We are done. Pretty cool. So once again, I want to say what you just saw is not easy, right? From the pre-calculus level work that you're currently doing or whatever the class that you're currently working in is, this is like two, three years ahead doing these kinds of proofs. But I honestly believe that if you're really interested in this sort of stuff, you should be exposed to it now. You totally have the chance to be able to understand this stuff and work through it. It won't be easy. It won't be easy like the sort of work that you're used to doing, right? If you are in the kind of position where you want to understand this sort of thing, the work that you're normally doing in your pre-calculus class probably isn't terribly difficult for you. But this right here, this is a really interesting thing that lets us see how far math gets out, what kind of stuff math is really like at the college level when we're really studying like serious level math. I think this stuff is really cool, absolutely beautiful, a great chance to just see logic sort of in its purest form, being able to make an argument that's really ironclad, and I think that's really cool. It's not for everybody. If you think this is just absolutely awful and you watch the whole thing just because, I don't know why you watch the whole thing, but if you watch through it and you really didn't like it, that's okay. There's lots of things to do out there in the world, but if you thought this was really cool, awesome. I think it's really cool too, and you can go ahead and you can study math if you're interested. You can study something like computer um, computer science where we talk about, where you talk about algorithms like that as well. There's lots of things that will let you have the same idea of well-argued proof of things building on top of each other, these really interesting conceptual ideas. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.